So my name is Lee Heron. I'm the Executive Director of Fernwood Neighborhood Resource Group Society. Um, thank you for coming to uh, this uh, evening where we're going to talk about uh, 10 years of uh, the Cornerstone Building in Neighborhood Hands. The Cornerstone Building, I think, was built in, in uh, the very early part of last century, um, 1910, 1911, 1912. It was, it's actually two buildings, legally. Um, that are kind of glued together, but it's so seamless you can't really tell. Um, it's right about here that uh, is the division between the parts of the building. We know that because interior, the interior wall there is actually like about three feet thick of brick. Yeah. So it is a brick building. It's really substantial. It was built by the Parfit Brothers. The Parfit Brothers Construction Company also built Vic High. And so this building was built as their office building and the offices were upstairs and then there was commercial down below and they built it where it is so that they could keep an eye on of course the much much bigger project of building Victoria High School. But this is a picture that uh, is just in our archives uh, from the 1980s. Um, you can see that at this point the building is really showing its, its age. Um, these were all glass lights, they've all been painted out. Why anybody would do that I have no idea because uh, we actually just ended up replacing them uh, eventually when we took it over. It was so much of a difficulty to strip them. The brick had also been painted. If you go back, you can see there was a beautiful cornice at one point that had been removed from the building. So fast forward to the early part of last decade. So this article came out in Monday Magazine in 2002. And um, that was the cover. The, the heroin trade had moved into Victoria uh, hardcore. and. Um, Various city policies were pushing it out of downtown and it was starting to show up in neighborhoods. Um, this article from 2002 um, detailed a, a child who was stuck with a needle in the park actually right behind this building, the Fernwood Community Center. Um, and yeah, in print we had funky junkie Fernwood, so that there's a lot of people in Victoria that still call the neighborhood funky junkie Fernwood. This, uh, this is what the building looked like by 2004-2005, so um, it had gone from sort of a vibrant uh, commercial place uh, with folks living upstairs to a boarded up wreck, and a large part of this was due to that drug trade really moving into to Fernwood, and so commercial tenants left, uh, the drug trade started moving in, people um, started to not feel safe coming to downtown Fernwood, and so that's downward spiral kind of starts and it, this is pretty much where it bottomed out in 2004-2005. When I say we through this presentation, the we I mean is uh, the board of directors and senior staff people of the Fernwood Community Center Society it was called at that time. We've subsequently changed our name to uh, the Fernwood Neighborhood Resource Group Society in part to reflect uh, moving out more broadly into the, the whole of the neighborhood. At the time that the, the time period we're talking about, I was the president uh, of the society. Um, I'll introduce some of the other board members, some of whom are even in the audience tonight, uh, that were part of the part of the we during that time. But that, that's the folks I'm talking about. So that's why we're having this talk about that building here in the Fernwood Community Center tonight. We realized when the building looked like that, that uh, we had a serious problem in our neighborhood. It was also starting to push into this building. So folks would come in here, shoot up in the bathroom. We had needles on our playground. Um, all of the other detritus of the, the drug trade was sort of everywhere in the neighborhood. There was lots of houses that were um, sort of drug houses. It was, it was pretty rough. Uh, there are some people who say, no, my street was beautiful, but it really was in pockets, but overall the neighborhood was pretty rough. And there was also a lot of petty crime, but also some fairly serious crime that was happening in the neighborhood at the time. We held a, what we called a neighborhood visioning forum um, in 2004. And this is some of the, uh, you know, we put the paper on the wall and, you know, had people sort of indicate what they really wanted to see in the neighborhood. And it's kind of interesting to look back. Uh, this is 11 years later, but, you know, community, the dots indicate that people thought it was a good idea and we should do that. So these are the sort of most popular ones, but just to call them out, community cafe restaurant, 
comfortable, attractive square with businesses of interest to the broader community. Buy Robin Kempton's building and open a community food services co-op, like on Hornby Island. <laughs> Allow and encourage more affordable housing and secondary suites and so on. So some of the issues that are still alive today in Victoria were certainly alive 10 years ago, but I think what you'll see as we go through this presentation is that the we of, the, of this presentation really did actually meet some of these challenges head on. And uh, we tried to deliver on what at that time were the neighborhood's objectives for our organization. One of our other responses as we were starting to um, define ourselves as a, as a group of people was to uh, articulate what we called our Declaration of Principles and Values. This document dates from 2005. Um, there's some notes on the left hand side, those are handwritten notes on index cards that I think I made one night as a number of us were discussing it in the pub. But we also publish the Principles and Values in the Village Vibe every uh, paper and it's of course on our website and in the hallway and everything. The reason I'm telling you this is because this is principle number two. Um, we realized at that time that we had to start, if we wanted to change what owners did with their properties in this neighborhood, that we ourselves needed to become owners. At the time we were also, um, we, we, this building here didn't look like this actually 10 years ago. It was in the there's a lot of disrepair. The city has done a lot of work, especially in the last five years. But in 2005, they actually were threatening to close this building. So we were very insecure in our tenure as an organization. Um, and we were looking also at like how we made things more secure for ourselves, but also to improve the neighborhood. So this is principle number two. One of the things we did manage to do was ask um, Mr. Kempton, who was the owner of the, the boarded up building, if we could take a tour of it. We expressed that we might have an interest in buying it, but we really didn't know. This is what we found, especially in the upstairs. The downstairs, all the commercial tenants uh, had left, but upstairs, one of the apartments was in actually relatively decent shape. The other, what are now three apartments, were essentially a squat, and the city, um, the city was kind of stuck. They were taking an enforcement approach. So, I mean, the, the building was really, really rough. Um, we took some shots uh, when we went through the building, and this is sort of some of the things that we saw upstairs. Um, <laughs> in terms of uh, the despair uh, that some of the residents there uh, may have been feeling, this particular photo is very poignant for me. Um, as is this one. I'll just give you a minute to read that. Can everybody read that? I apologize for the coarse language, but this is uh, as we found it. So this was a pretty sad place. Um, the whole downtown of Fernwood was suffering at that time. There was a, a great pub in the 90s called the Georgian Dragon, and by 2004, um, I think at one point, there were maybe you know two tables. It seats 150 now. But there might have been eight of us in there, and six of us are in the room now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we put the jukebox on and sing just to uh, make ourselves feel better that, that you know it was so empty. But we'd look across the street at the building, and we'd see, uh, you know, the dealers, not the dealer, not the, the high-level dealer, but the, the low-level distributor, I guess, uh, running around on a BMX bike with a strobe light on the front and. They rode bikes because they could go all through this neighborhood and the cops couldn't follow them through all the road cutoffs and so on, so it was very efficient. Um, I felt this uh, textbook was quite ironic. Uh, it's titled Abnormal Psychology and Modern Life. <laughs> and that this shot in particular was hopeful. But yeah, it really it really was it really was a sad uh, a sad place. We decided that we really needed to do something, and in the middle of uh, 2005 in June, um, and there's at least 
four of us in the room who were present out of ten that night. Um, I brought a presentation to our board of directors. You could see that at one point this was a really beautiful space upstairs. Um, basically, we, we did our homework. We had a, a bit of a business plan. We really didn't know what we were getting into, but we knew we needed to do something, and one of our other principles is to take action. So we were into we were into trying whatever we could do. Um, so that's me, as I said. Uh, anybody know who this person is? <laughs> She's the mayor of Victoria now. Paula, you want to stand up or wave? <laughs> Tanya. Tanya's not here tonight, she's probably taking care of the kids. Margaret Hantiak uh, writes regularly for the Village Vibe. She's not here tonight, unfortunately, but she still lives in the neighborhood. That's Dave Kesson at the very back there, who, who's uh, with Tanya. Thank you. Lenore. <laughs> and uh, Guy Vincent. He didn't stay with us for long after this, but uh, he still lives uh, just over on Pembroke Street. So. These were all just neighborhood folks. We did have a plan. Uh, some handwritten notes up in the top of the corner that I found in my files as I was digging through them today. Um, but uh, these were our objectives at the time. Um, repair the core of the neighborhood, expand our organization as an enterprising nonprofit, better integrate our programs and services into the neighborhood, rebuild community in Fernwood, and <laughs> engage uh, Robin Kempton as a key neighborhood stakeholder. I'll do a little evaluation when we get uh, to closer to the end. So the question on many people's mind, I guess, how did we do this? So we had been very lucky as an organization in 2000 to be given this beautiful character house. Now, when it was given to us, um, it wasn't this beautiful. We actually put a substantial amount of money and investment and time into it. But it was, it was in, all in all, it was in actually very good condition. Um, and so uh, it was sitting as an asset on our books. We were using it for one of our programs, um, but it was a very valuable asset. And as people may recall, in the early part of the 2000s, property values throughout Victoria had really appreciated, and this property in particular had also uh, substantially appreciated in value. So. What we did was we swapped that house for the cornerstone building and a mortgage from Mr. Kimpton. And that was what you might call unconventional financing. Um, but what people don't realize is you can't get financing for an empty commercial building. A commercial building is a stream of income to the bank. The income reduces the debt no income, no mortgage. And so we had to get creative. And we also took a fairly significant risk at the time. But we were younger, as you might be able to detect, <laughs> and very enthusiastic. And so this is uh, me signing that document there, signing it on the back of Roberta Martel, who was our executive director at the time. So. At that event, after I had signed it, our, our staff were very excited and so they immediately stormed the barricades and uh, ripped the for sale and for lease signs down off the... The sale hasn't executed yet, we've just agreed to do it, but <laughs> they, wouldn't be, they wouldn't be stopped. There was a lot of pent-up anger and frustration at, at the time in the neighborhood broadly about... Because this building had been very functional five years before and the, the neighborhood had been... Um, it had been a really fun place to, to spend time in that building and, and then all that had sort of, it felt like it had been taken away from us. There was a lot of positive press uh, about uh, the purchase, most notably, of course, in our own uh, newsletter, the, uh, the Village Vibe. So positive. <laughs> um, that's our executive director, Roberta Martel, on the left, uh, the now mayor, Lisa Helps, and uh, the owner of the building, Kitty Corner, Ron Spence. Um, a few days after the purchase went through, this was a, 
in one of the newspapers in town. There's a lot of clippings, actually. Um, there was a lot of positive energy and positive intention, a lot of hope that things were, were changing, both from neighborhood residents and from uh, well-wishers from other neighborhoods. Because we didn't quite have enough to do, um, we decided to organize at that time what was the biggest fern fest ever. We ironically titled it Fern Woodstock. Uh, and it was uh, held in the park uh, back there. Um, three days of peace uh, and music, August 26th to 28th, so a mere three weeks after the sale had closed. Um, that's what Fernfest looked like in 2005. Just is that, are people laughing? Because does anybody think that that's what it looks like now? <laughs> I mean, we put up posters, we did all the things that we, we try to do now, but we didn't have that sort of same feeling of neighborhood spirit in those, in those days. A lot of that had sort of ebbed away. And yeah, you know, people came, there was music in the park, but it's, it's uh, not that well attended, actually, in retrospect. I think we thought this was a fantastic turnout at the time. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> we also held a, uh, a parade uh, not too long after uh, in front of the building. Um, that's me in the back there. That's Dave Kesson. There's a picture of uh, Tanya dressed as a chicken somewhere, but uh, she managed to elude it in, in the, the camera in this photo. Um, I, my recollection of this day in particular was uh, a gentleman from the neighboring property came over and asked me why we were having a street closure and uh, making so much noise. I said, we just bought this building, we're really excited, we're going to fix it up and everything's going to be great. And he said, well why don't you have a party after you fix it up? <laughs> <laughs> I said, good idea, we'll have that one then too. Uh, Tanya was uh, inspired us all by uh, making these beautiful flags. I think her mother uh, and her, there is one that we had at the time on the, on the roof of this building. And then we decided, well, we need one for each of the parapets on the building. So she had to make another six or seven. Uh, and we needed them like instantly. So she was up all hours, but they sure uh, were beautiful. This photo in particular still makes me uh, smile for sure. Um, we also got a very expensive large banner that was quite clever, we thought. It said, turning the corner into the future. Uh, and so the, it, turned, it turned around the corner, yeah. So, I mean, hey, you gotta work with whatever you can come up with, hey? And we called the building the corner stone because it's kind of made of brick and it's on the corner. It wasn't very long before everybody was calling it that and nobody's called it anything else since. Terry claims that he did not make this sign. <laughs> but somebody did. Um, you can see uh, it was raining whenever this photo was taken, but uh, we worked through the fall, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. But yeah, people honked, and it was very, you know, inspiring to all of us inside. It, it reminded us that, you know, even though we were working inside, there were people outside who were on our, who had our back. Um, we did invite the whole community down, and I think for at least a month, all we did was give tours of the building inside. I mean, like, we didn't even really start doing anything. We just sort of showed the neighborhood around and said, yeah, it was actually like this inside, if you can believe it. We did eventually start demolishing it, and community members helped us. This photo's from a little bit later, but uh, Terry reminded me, um, as did Lenore, interestingly enough, that there was a photo with this uh, great uh, little flags uh, hanging there, dream big and live exuberantly. So, uh, yeah, we, we really felt like... Just buying the building, we really felt like we'd accomplished something. We didn't fully appreciate what a task it would be to take it apart and put it back together again, but there was a lot of spirit in the neighborhood in those days. And yes, mm -hmm. you may recognize oh, you? former councillor Helen Hughes. She came out on a number of occasions and wielded a hammer and showed up uh, some of the younger gentlemen. <laughs> Again, Roberta. I can't say enough about Roberta. I mean, she was everywhere during that time. She cut the sleeves off her shirt so, you know, she could show off how strong she was. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, this whole project um, really revolved and spiraled all around her, for sure. Uh, it wouldn't have happened without her.
Here's a fine picture of uh, the two of us removing uh, a special piece that we found downstairs in the basement. <laughs> Those uh, masks were actually safety related for sure. I don't want to remove that thing. Um, and uh, there was a certain uh, person, Lisa Helps, who was our vice president at the time and later became the president of uh, Fernwood Neighborhood Resource Group Society, directing traffic. Um, which uh, she's gotten really good at now that she works downtown. Um, that's Lenore on the left. Lenore was uh, a constant presence out front, our public face, uh, organizing people going in, making sure they were dressed safely, and etc. And, and this chap here, uh, Mr. Spence, he lives in half a year in Thailand now, but he owns the building Kitty Corner, so not the Belfry, not the Fernwood Inn, but the other one on the corner, the big one. Um, he was instrumental in making this all happen because he gave us access to his line of credit. We had to pay him back, but just at the going rate. So this is what I'm talking about, about creative financing. This really was a neighborhood project, and although there's a lot of us who put a lot into it uh, in terms of sweat equity, there's a lot of people that put a lot into it in other ways too. And Ron's one of them. I had to work hard to find a photo of Jim Stark on the right, but that's Jim with Dave. Uh, Jim was an architect uh, by training and so uh, was probably undoubtedly conferring with Dave and giving advice. That's Tanya Wegwitz, uh, who was our treasurer at the time. Um, we were, man, it was a lot, a lot of uh, fun stuff uh, gutting this building and putting it back together. But yeah, the dust masks were not a fashion statement. It was, uh, it was grim. And there's one more. <laughs> we managed to get her to look up just for a second uh, to get this photo, but uh, yeah, there's one of our junior uh, helpers. And it was hard also to find a picture of Margaret. She was a little camera shy, but I found one with her uh, sticking her head out the back window with Roberta. So that's Roberta on the left and Margaret Hantiak on the right. Um, I can't say enough about this guy in the yellow shirt. Um, I was hoping he'd be here tonight. Uh, he's a Fernwood resident, a volunteer of the organization, a member of the organization. But again, similar to Roberta, this project wouldn't have succeeded without him. His name's Guard Collins. There isn't a picture of Guard's face because he was always working and he was too busy for photographs. So uh, he was always in motion. He, he's a contractor by trade. He builds uh, his buildings on his own account as well as manages property. And he came to us midway through the project and said, I will, I will help you in any way you need. You let me know let, let me know what you need and I'll do it. And eventually I think he became sort of more of a general contractor, is that a fair statement, for the project, certainly in its concluding stages. Um, and he subsequently built our property at Park Place on Yukon Street. In terms of the next steps, we were kind of, you know, not fumbling our way along entirely, but we didn't necessarily have the depth of understanding that he did, so he really, really kept us on track. Alan Lowe. Um, I just want to say a quick word about the funding environment in general. I mean, today, funders are, oh, you need to show evidence that there's other funders who are coming in before we'll come in. It's kind of like, well, somebody has to be first. <clears throat> in this project, Alan Lowe was first. Um, he came down and visited the site. He saw that we were energetic and enthusiastic. He ensured that the building inspectors would work with us um, to make this possible. And he also was first in with a funding commitment. In turn, that funding commitment, I think, was le leveraged at least eight times um, from other funders, knowing that the city was supporting it. The other levels of government came in as well as other funders. So somebody's got to be first. And in this case, uh, it was Mayor Lowe. Um, and this shot, again, that's uh, Lisa from behind. But um, we were all volunteers, whether people were being paid as staff or whether they were, uh, you know, board members, or everybody was volunteering because this was an all-consuming project. It wasn't a nine-to-five Monday to Friday project. Um, and yeah, I think we ask, our estimate is that about ten thousand hours of volunteer time went into it. And if we had had to pay for that, even at <coughs> minimum wage, 
um, it would have added at least another 100,000 to the, well, in those days, 80,000 to the cost. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a huge commitment by the community in terms of sweat equity to make this happen. And who could forget, uh, Roberta had previously worked for the David Suzuki Foundation, and so she invited Dr. Suzuki to uh, come to Victoria, and he said he would. So how about that? As I recall, the question was, how can we build sustainable neighborhoods? And he didn't spend even one minute talking about that, but it was he still held the audience <laughs> captivated for an hour anyways. And uh, yeah, there's a great photo of the doc and Roberta. Um, in particular, he basically donated a lecture which we were able to sell tickets to. Um, that ended up being a, a sizable amount of money which we were able to leverage also from uh, a couple of other funders, the Green Building Fund, I think it's called, to install geothermal heating. I'm not going to go into that in any great detail, but basically take water from under the earth. And so this was a big drilling, drilling rig that came in. It was taller than the building to put two wells in so the water circulates like this, it goes through a heat exchanger, we capture heat from that water and it offsets the need to heat uh, water up to temperature to circulate heat through the building. So it saves on carbon emissions, it's kind of a passive, long-term sustainable source of energy. What I remember most, uh, maybe it's because my own daughter was uh, three or four years old at the time, but is the kids. My daughter was too young to help. <laughs> but. Uh, these kids uh, came out weekend after weekend, and um, sometimes we felt like we were babysitting them, but they actually worked pretty hard. Um, and uh, we got a number of shots of them. But it's not just how hard they worked, it's the, the sense of pride that uh, they had in being part of something. I think they even understood, like they didn't understand the whole context, but they knew they were part of something. and that's. I think what all of us just hope for at some point in our life is to feel like we're part of something. So they were pretty lucky and, uh, yeah, and pretty happy about uh, participating. So we brought it back. Um, it, uh, there's a lot that went into it between the demolition and this part, but you know, I'll spare you all the details of contractors coming and going and trucks and stuff being hauled away and whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, that's <laughs> like this was big news in the city uh, at that time. Um, we got on the jumbotron in front of the new arena. It was pretty exciting. Yeah. <laughs> My wife did a thing. Denise Savoy is on the left there, um, and uh, of course it's Rob Fleming on the right, and you know the people in the middle by now, I think. Um, Denise was our federal member of parliament at the time, uh, but this was just after we had reopened the cafe and so we were sort of having a grand uh, celebration in this fall of 2006. In terms of impact, um, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation recognized this initiative um, and between Roberta and I, I think we've probably made 10 speeches across the country, most of them in other provinces, at CMHC's expense. This one means more to me. Um, the Hallmark Society of uh, Victoria uh, gave us their President's Award for uh, the rescue and adaptive reuse of the Cornerstone Building in the heart of Fernwood. <clears throat> so how did we do against our own objectives setting out? Um, I feel like we got four out of five. Um, I don't know how hard we tried on number five, um, <laughs> for better or for worse. Um, maybe things would have turned out differently if we put more energy behind that, but in terms of the rest of it, I think it was a, a terrific success. Um, I don't know that I spent enough time explaining, but we also, the cafe on the corner is our cafe. So Fernwood NRG opened that cafe, the Cornerstone Cafe, as part of its own account in 2006. We subsequently had to roll it out into a subsidiary company. Um, and in fact, now we have two businesses in the building, the hair salon, Studio 1313, and the Cornerstone Cafe. So in terms of expanding as an enterprising nonprofit, that was a big idea and a hope in 2005. And I'm here today to tell you, I think anyways, in my own opinion, that it was a tremendous success. People come to us now to talk about social enterprise also. Um, we've been asked to speak at 
provincial events down at the legislature and all kinds of stuff. This is principle number one for us, neighborhood sustainability, which we define as economic, social, and environmental. So back in those days when I was being asked by CMHC to travel the country uh, to talk about this project, I also used this evaluation scheme to sort of look at it through these three lenses and see how we did. On a social front, I mean, there's four successful businesses in the building today. When we opened the building, the adult unemployment rate in this neighborhood was above 15%. I don't know what it is now, but 30 jobs uh, helps. And most of the folks that work here and also work in the successful inn and the expanded belfry and all the other businesses that have thrived now in the neighborhood, it's, it's not insignificant. We sort of marked the, the end of disinvestment in Fernwood and the beginning of reinvestment in Fernwood. Four families with eight children now have uh, safe, affordable housing right in the heart of the neighborhood. The cafe is a big gathering place for the neighborhood and a, and a place where people can meet their neighbors. That was really important at that time because we had, we had not had those gathering places in the neighborhood and so neighbors didn't know each other uh, other than maybe direct neighbors. Um, like I said, a lot of volunteers. But crime is an interesting one that we can actually measure. So I got some statistics from the police department in 2009. Um, the blue line is, is Fernwood. Police call-outs from 2004 to 2009 declined 39%. Crime is going down generally, even in the city of Victoria, or maybe people are calling the police less. But this is a pretty strong indicator that, you know, following 2005, the neighborhood got quite a bit safer. I, can't, I don't know if you can read on the side, but most of these are actually pretty serious crimes. Um, theft of vehicle. In 2004, 87 cars were reported stolen in Fernwood. By 2009, that number had declined 74%. 23 is still, like, 23 too many, but um, that's a significant reduction. And you can go down the list. Shots fired. Nine reports in 2004. Down to a mere three in 2009. <laughs> Assault, including sexual assault, uh, down 45%. So, I mean, Fernwood is still not a perfect neighborhood, and we all know that. And this is just 2009. I don't have 2014 numbers up here. But I, I believe that I, I'm not attributing it all to the Cornerstone uh, project. But I think that action really did start to transform the neighborhood in, in a really positive and profound way. I talked about the geothermal heating. We had an engineer come in and assess it uh, for free. They, they were keen to do that, and so we, we let them at it. And they calculated that we've offset 14 tons of carbon emissions annually on average. So in 10 years, that's 140 tons. That's not nothing. Although maybe it's not much, but I mean, it's one neighborhood's contribution from one building, right? And based on our experience, a neighbor across the street installed uh, um, one too, so you know, I mean, maybe there's knock on effects. We're also ready to do solar on the roof when uh, we have the money. But the, econo the economics of doing that now make a lot of sense. This is a great colorful diagram, I don't know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> it's something to do with heat exchange and saving carbon emissions, but. You can watch this on the internet and look at that, press pause and just study that yourself. <laughs> the building initially didn't, you know, make money for us and it was a few years. We had certainly put a lot of money out and into it, but it does generate net income now for us. As a charity, um, having our own independent source of income is valuable to us and allows us to reinvest in programs and services for people in Fernwood. So this is a stream of income that is completely under our control and it will remain that way for generations. So this is a powerful tool for us long term as a neighborhood. We also have our own businesses that operate in the building, which is sort of like a double uh, benefit in that regard. And again, something you can measure, uh, property values in this neighborhood were extremely depressed uh, at the lowest point in 2005. Um, this is a sort of a 10-year picture again. It was part of my evaluation that I did for CMHC in 2009. But 
we all know that property values appreciated dramatically through this period, and that's a you know certainly Canada-wide phenomenon, not a global phenomenon even, not necessarily a Victoria phenomenon. But inside Victoria, houses in Fernwood were just a little bit you know less than five, very close to the average in Victoria in 1999, 2000, 2001. But as the neighborhood started to decline, a big gap opened up, and some people kind of had the good fortune to buy into the neighborhood uh, you know, at these uh, depressed prices. But they didn't necessarily know things were getting better. Um, but they really did. These uh, 2006 values were calculated in the summer of 2005. So this is January 2006, but the data is from June, June 30th or July 1st, 2005, which was a month before we bought the building. So if you wanted to buy in Fernwood, that was, <laughs> that was when to do it. Five years later, Fernwood was slightly more desirable on average than other neighborhoods in the city. So this, this change represents actually, for those who are lucky enough to own property, a substantial uh, incremental generation of wealth for that. How did this affect our organization? In 2005, before we bought the building, we were confined to this building and our house down the road. We had roughly 25 staff. Um, we had programs, these are our core programs. Child care, Best Babies is a prenatal health and nutrition program. Recreation, we do a little bit as we have a little gymnasium and we do some rec programs through the community here. Family support programs, that's what happens in this building. And that's primarily all that we did in 2005. Um, at that time, our budget was just under, just over about half of what it is now. Um, we did have $600,000 of assets, which is not nothing, but that was primarily that house down the road. Um, net assets, roughly 400000 So that represents the equity that we were able to put into that building, which is why it all worked from the beginning. You always need equity. And we were 51% dependent on grants from external sources. We're only, we're bigger now, we do a lot more, but property doesn't necessarily employ a huge number of people in and of itself. I'm not including here the activities of our company, which is a legally separate entity. The company employs, how many do you have? 12. 12, so 18 uh, staff the company on top of the 35 sort of full-time people here at Fernwood in the community center. We now own four properties in Fernwood, three of which are right in the core of the neighborhood. Um, we have 10 families that live in our affordable housing units, uh, five commercial tenants, including our two uh, own commercial tenants that are our, part of our own company. We're seen as a leader in the, in the region in social enterprise, having two uh, social enterprises that we operate. And we've added affordable housing. There's very little funding for food security. Almost all of our food security activities uh, we fund out of our own account. And that's again because we have our own independent streams of income. So yeah, the growth in assets is uh, substantial, and the growth in net assets is again very significant. But as our treasurer mentioned, this number is really more like about two million. But on our books, due to accounting policies, that's just the way it appears. But if we were to liquidate everything and sell it off, there'd be probably two million dollars left. But the statistic that I'm most proud of is this one: um, that grant dependence. I mean, if someone came along tomorrow and said, hey, we'd like to offer you $100,000 to provide this great program in Fernwood, I'd say, where do I sign? But that hasn't been the reality, more or less, for the last 15 years. Organizations that um, don't have their own independent sources of income are struggling and being forced to cut service at the front line. We've been adding service uh, for the last five years, right, Shauna? Yeah. <laughs> this is as fast as I let her. It's as fast as I let her. Yeah. Um, but we're only able to do that because we have that independence, and so that's where it comes back to this, right? This was a principle that we articulated in 2005. Ten years on, I mean, at that point, I was on the board of directors. I was the president. 
Now I'm the executive director and senior staff person, but I'm the person that presents the budget to the board, and I really understand the meaning of this. I know all the things we would not be able to do if we did not have our own sources of income. So I really think control and ownership do matter. They matter for two reasons. Firstly, it's, a, it's, it's about the income, but secondly, it's also a de it's self determination. As a neighborhood, when we own properties in the core of our neighborhood, we can determine collectively um, what, we, what kinds of development we want to have, what kinds of businesses we want to have. Um, as a stakeholder or another organization, we might be able to influence that, but there's a big difference between control and influence. Thanks all these people, thanks to all of the volunteers, um, the City of Victoria, uh, the Mayor, thanks everyone, thanks for listening.